I truly believe that the term personal branding or personal brand as a whole, it's more than just a trend now. I think it's at the highest level that it's been since it was invented, to be honest. And it's more of a movement now, like everybody's trying to build a personal brand or to run, you know, personal branding campaigns and actually, you know, become the brand behind the business or you can call it whatever you like. But you see every day people that are becoming internet famous or you actually see the big names in the game. You know, people like Dan Locke and Ty Lopez and Bradley and Grant Cardone. And you may wonder like, what are these guys are actually doing behind the scenes to get the attention online and you know become famous and actually getting paid to do what they actually love so you know that i like actionable steps and that's why in this episode i have jeremy haynes and he actually worked with all the names that i mentioned previously and he's going to share with us some powerful strategies that can be implemented right away Welcome to High End Client Acquisition Podcast. My name is Marian, I'm your host, and this show is here to teach you how to attract your dream clients on autopilot in 30 days or less. Each week, I bring you a guest or a strategy that can help you take your business to the next level. Don't forget, you can always get the episodes in your inbox or messenger at clientacquisitionpodcast.com. Jeremy, um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to share all your <laughs> secrets with us here. But oh, yeah. so, you know, everybody in the marketing sales funnels, you know, digital world knows who you are. And of course, the big names that you've been working with. But for people maybe that are in different industries or they're just not really, you know, into the whole personal branding game. Do you mind giving us a quick story about how did you get started into, uh, into online game? Oh yeah. Good question. So I grew up in Ohio and I was, I was pretty regular. I had a factory work for a father, a babysitter for a mother. Um, my first jobs, I was a salesperson in direct TV and then I transitioned to selling phones in Costco that ended up enabling me to leave Ohio. I lived in Denver for about a year and a half. And then, uh, I ended up down in Miami. Long story short, first three months that I was in Miami, I sold a phone to this guy and he ended up being a business owner uh, with this company in North Miami Beach. Ends up the guy needed somebody that he described as young and capable. <laughs> um, he, he just assumed that everybody who was young like knew what they were doing on social media and could adapt in his viewpoint with all these other skills that I didn't even know existed. Um, that ended up being extremely valuable in what I built a foundation of my entire digital marketing career on. This guy hires me as his, as his head of marketing uh, this becomes an incredible resume builder for me. I'm training salespeople in his organization. I'm doing things like Facebook ads. At the time, there was a webinar platform called Stealth Seminar. Um, so that was, that was the big thing that we were pumping back then. We were selling low level franchises that were about 10K for a franchisee to go out and essentially just retrofit a business's, LED, well, a business's lighting structures into LEDs, which apparently saves them a lot of money. So long story short, this guy comes to me one day and he's like, Jeremy, you know, I ran out of money and I gotta let you go. You're not going to have a job by the end of the week. So I go, I go home, I go on fiber.com. And what I did is I paid this lady 10 bucks. I described like my previous jobs of sales jobs, really. And I was a stock boy before that at a grocery store. <laughs> and I described this job as my head of my head of marketing and like what I did, my responsibilities and things like that. Um, the next day I get, I get the resume back. So this is Tuesday. Now I upload it to indeed.com, which is, which is like this giant, I'm sure you know what it is but yeah. for people who don't know. It's a, it's like a recruiting site, essentially. It's like a job board, but recruiters look at it. So by Wednesday morning, so on Monday, this guy comes to me and fi fires me Monday night. I get the resume requested Tuesday. I get it back Tuesday. I get it on indeed.com Wednesday comes around and get a call from Grant Cardone's recruiter. And they're, and they're like, listen, we need somebody. We're going to call it an email marketing specialist. Email marketing manager was my first title there for the first three months. It was a temp job. And it was to come in and essentially take his 150,000 contacts, uh, manage the database, teach his 25 salespeople how to use it. They were using Infusionsoft at the time 
And lo and behold, they're not doing any digital marketing, <laughs> like none, wow. like no, no Facebook ads, no Google AdWords stuff. I mean, they weren't even sending emails to these 150,000 contacts. The salespeople, they, they literally didn't know how to go in and, and tap the warm leads that they already had. Their daily responsibilities were essentially to create cold lists that they would use in Excel and cold call them. They were generating one to $3 million a month in contract value, value that way. So anyway, long, you know, the moral of the story is I, I saw a massive opportunity and they put a commission on our head in the creative room as well. They said, listen guys, there's nine of you. We'll split 10% of all digital revenues that come in between you guys. And it's just your responsibility to grow this, grow this side of the business. So the, you know, that was about like 1.2, maybe 1.4%. Whoever drove the most got that extra like 0.1 or 0.2. Yeah. You know? So I'm going to be honest. I was like 19 and a half, 20 years old when I was working there. I worked there for 13 months altogether. This, this changed my entire mindset and helped me grow as an entrepreneur. Wouldn't be who I am without, without Grant's help and the entire organization collectively helping, helping me as a young person. Uh, but this was sweet. I mean, this was like how you see Grant Cardone, but applied to digital marketing. So we were trying to figure out how we could gain omnipresence on all advertising channels. We had 150 different products plus that we were trying to sell. So video products, audio products, you know, courses, events, freaking merchandise, I, every, everything you could think of. On top of that, you know, there was 25 salespeople and growing. By the time I left, there were 40. So, so lead gen was a massive thing. Uh, I had to build out all the marketing automation. Um, I, I could talk like a nerd all day on how, how in-depth and crazy that was. But long story short, $40,000 a month when I first started coming in digitally ended up being a couple million dollars a month. We averaged, we averaged for the 13 months I was there, 1.8 mil per month. Uh, and they do substantially greater quantity and revenue now, I, I believe, um, if, if they've kept that momentum going. But point is, they capped me at 10K for the last three months that I was working there as far as my commissions. Started, started expensing the jet fuel against us. Um, <laughs> now, nowadays, from the, from the people who actually still work there, they've told me since that they've removed the bonus structure altogether. So I'm, I'm glad I left when I did because that was a big incentive for me. But I started my marketing agency. It's been about four years now at the time we're recording this. And all we do is work with personal brands, but, but we, I used to brag about this. We, we turn down 95% of the people that come to us because 95% of the personal brands who want to work with us, they just flat out aren't positioned to really, to really get big results. We like to come in like what I imagine Barry Bonds felt like when he was peak steroid usage, you know, he sees a batter on first, second, and third base. He knows he's going to rip a grand slam. Like that's how we like to feel when we approach personal brands and metaphorically meaning we like to take people to seven figures a month. Um, we've worked with seven different personal brands we've taken to that level. We've worked with 41 people we've been able to help take to six figures a month. And obviously we're not, we're not taking sole credit for this. This is, you know, collective effort, obviously on behalf of the personal brand and their entire teams. Um, more successful st case studies that we've had have been people like Dan Locke. Uh, he was about, about 300 K a month in, uh, March, April of 2018. And now he's upwards just shy of 3 million per month. And it's been, it's been under a year. Um, and of course he's, he's got at this point a staff of well over a hundred, but when we first got started, it was about, about 15, 20 ish people, um, all together. Uh, point is there's, there's a lot that not to sound pretentious that we know from being as experienced as we are deploying literally millions of dollars per month in ad spend that flat out. I mean, people just don't know about there. There are truly a lot of secrets. You know, Brad, Bradley, one of my, one of my previous clients talked about this. He was doing an ad video and this is a great hook. <laughs> you, you hear a lot of people talk about the fact that it just takes hard work to be successful. And that's untrue. There are a lot of secrets that get you and get the big successful guys there and keep them there. Uh, but they're, they're very, they're very unknown. So long story short, uh, my, my specialized skills in digital marketing, you know, you could talk about any form of advertising on any ad channel. I'm, I'm definitely skilled at it. And so is my team, um, you know, marketing automation, all the chat bots, emails, um, operational system stuff that we need to figure out as well. You know, we're, we're overall consultants for businesses. So it's not just like digital marketing. It's like marketing strategy and, you know, coordinating the entire teams and stuff like that. But yeah, I went from, went from stock boy in Ohio to, you know, definitely a bunch of transitions in between to where I'm at now as a, as a, as a multi seven figure agency owner, <laughs> man, yeah, I, that's, that's a, that's a true journey right there. Um, <laughs> I knew a little bit of your story, but I didn't know it like so in depth. So appreciate um, you sharing all that with us. It's oh, yeah. like, it's just what you, and that happened over, you know, how many years? Well, I'm 25 now. I just turned 25 on April 30th. So that's, it's been, it's been about seven years now since I've uh, like gotten into the game of digital marketing. 
that's legit, man. Oh, yeah. um, and again, like it, <laughs> just the hustle um, itself, it's been, you know, it's been a, an insane journey. So you shared a few, uh, a few things right there. And you, of course, everything from what you did um, in Grant Cardone's office and then moving into your, your own business. So obviously, since you work with so many big names, you know, people like Dan Locke and Ty Lopez and Bradley and, and a bunch of other um, huge personal brands mm -hmm. what do you think nowadays like in 2019 moving you know forward what do you think is the first step of somebody that just wants to start building um, you know a personal brand online regardless if it's about a speaker or somebody that wants to become a speaker you know an author uh, somebody that's just doing coaching or, or any other industry out there what do you think is the first step that somebody can take like let's say tomorrow Good question. So let's let's delineate between the two types of people that are going to need the answer to this because they're they're two wildly different answers. There's the person who's like literally just getting started, and this and this could be in anything. I mean, as an example, when I was just getting started in business, I didn't already have significant results. You know, I just got done working for Grant. That was technically like my my result that I was able to flex in order to get a little bit of authority to then steamroll and and keep that momentum into getting more authority and more positioning and, and blah blah blah. But there are a lot of people who are very legitimate business owners. For example, there's a guy, I, I have 1,900 students that I teach how to start and scale marketing agencies. But I go meet people all the time who are agency owners who have exited. I, I met a guy, $54 million exit and $112 million exit on two different agencies. Why doesn't he have 1,900 students teaching people how to start and scale marketing agencies? It's because he, do, he doesn't have a personal brand. And there's, once again, there's a few secrets that, need, that people need to apply. Uh, in order to get the positioning, to get the results, in order to do things online, like for example, sell courses and just be a, be a digital mentor. So, long story short, in, in the two examples for the person who's just trying to get started and the person who's technically already got a lot of real life results that's trying to get started, the answers are quite different because the person who already has real results, they can kind of skip a few steps and get to the positioning phase where absolutely they need to go take a bunch of great photos. Um, the easiest thing to do is hire a photographer and don't just take, don't just take BS shots where it's like you, uh, you know, looking like a model and you only bring like one or two outfits, like really try it. This like try, try to, for example, book a photographer per month and try to get like seven to eight different outfits in there, but do what, do what's called action shots. So do things. We're not necessarily looking at the camera. Uh, if you want to take it a step further, you would be doing things in an environment being the identity that your ideal customers see themselves in. So as an example, if you're a biz op guy or girl, you know, and you're selling people on something that can help them make more revenues, you typically need to be in a position where you're showcasing the identity that they see themselves as. Like they see themselves in your story. So to be able to document that is, is, is essentially applied psychology. But once again, if you're already somebody who has real life, real life results, like you've sold businesses, you know, you already have something you can flex in a sense. You already have authority that you're associated with. The game's a little different. You can immediately start getting press. You know, you could probably reach out to different journalists right away and they'd actually be interested in publishing your kind of story for free because you'd have legitimate, you'd have legitimate results that other people would want to know. And that's kind of what drives press in a sense, depending on where, what kind of journalist you're talking to. There's a whole different kind of influencer and like a different kind of personal brand though. And it's the, for example, like one of my buddies, Julius Dean, he's a magician. Yeah. And he's a completely different personal brand than somebody like Dan Locke who's selling information products and how to be a high ticket closer. Um, and those two games are completely different. You know, the, the influencer approach is really just a game of increasing the quantity of attention that you have. And then the way that you monetize that are through things like what Julius does, like tours, merchandise, teaching people how to do magic in his case. Um, you know, just selling like the tricks itself. Like here's, here's the stuff you actually need to be able to do it. Um, and brand deals, you know, getting paid to show up somewhere, um, having somebody pay to actually sponsor something that, that goes into your content. That's a different type of personal brand. But in, in either sense, if that's the kind of personal brand you want to go after, you essentially just need to be creating good content that people actually want to watch and then do what Julius did. It, he, he shared the strategy uh, with me when he was, when he was here in Miami, uh, you stand at my place and I invited him to come, come and speak at my, at my yearly event called the internet earners summit. He dropped some bombs on the crowd. There's 150 people there. They learned this. It's really simple. He created good content, him doing magic tricks. He reached out to pages who had large followings and he asked them to share it. That's all he did. 
<laughs> he he freaking blew up because he built a network of people that were sharing his content and then he was able to go show other big pages hey these big people shared my content look at the reach that they got and look at all the engagement they got on sharing that post that made their pages look awesome they then shared it too he kept that momentum going until he built up a nice little network his own page built up and then he would essentially do like i'll share your content if you share my content but he would only do that with people that had good association with his brand, not just random people, yeah. um, people who are who are like, you know, the kind of followers that he already has that he knows would would readily follow him if they became aware of who he was. So, long story short, if you're if you're just getting started, like if you don't have any results yet in real life, if you don't, you know, if you're not pulling rabbits out of a hat like a magician, or you're not you're not doing something interesting like that, you really got to ask yourself, like, what what do you eventually want to be as a personal brand, like? Do you just want the influence? Like, do you just want to go to cool places that other people can't go and like get some hotels for free or something like that or get products sent to you? Or, or do you want to be the kind of personal brand that's teaching people about something? And do you want to be more of one of these mentors you see that's like selling courses, you know, like a speaker or, you know, somebody that's like a high ticket coach, um, like teaching people group coaching as an example. If, if you're in that route, you've got to be very clear on who your customers are. Uh, one of my clients, Garrett White, he has a book. He's been doing this for 15 years. He has a Four book. Year literally this thick, okay? Front and back, line by line, just a spiral bound book of 15 years worth of men's pain points because he, he has a program called Wake Up Warrior where he teaches married businessmen net, netting at least 250K how to be well balanced in all areas of their life. If, if, if you ask Garrett White, you say, Garrett, get, give me the top pain points of why men struggle and why they buy your program. He, he can instantly detail on a whiteboard the, the exact reasons that they're gonna end up right in front of him what, what led them there and how they initially started. Like, and every step he's, he's inside their head. You know, if he talks to them, they're like, dude, how, how do you understand? Like all this stuff never even talked about it. And they're dark truths. People don't like to talk about. But my point is if you're just getting started, it might be tough to think who is, who is my ideal customer? What are their pain points? What, what are the symptoms that they're experiencing in their life? And how can I, how can I communicate that I'm a problem solver? to that specific scenario. Usually the best way to do it is, is kind of what Gary Vee talks about a little bit where it's like documenting your story. But the reason you document your story is because people find relatability in your story who are below your story. People will see themselves being able to, to get to where you're at as you're documenting where you're at. So there's a whole, there's a whole slew of people as you continue to climb in life that wish they were in your position. So as you document what you're doing, people are literally seeing where you're at, what you're doing, what you're struggling with. They want to experience your struggles because their struggles are much worse. Uh, they want to experience your highs. Um, they want to go through that same process and watching you do it is, is just incredible momentum for these people who start following you and then they start sharing your content because they find relatability in it. Um, just remember, this is just, this is natural psychology. As soon as a human identifies like, oh, I have this belief. I want other people to know that this is my belief. And I also want to reaffirm that my beliefs are true. So we'll typically do that through community. So as an example, if I find a personal brand who I relate to, I'm immediately going to share their content and be like, hey, other people follow this guy. Because if other people from my friends also follow this person, that validates the fact that what I just started believing in is a good belief. And now I'm creating other people who share that belief, which enables me to have a little reality. So through time, the, the easiest way to kind of tap into that natural psychology that occurs on the internet is to tap into what's called an echo chamber. So if you're just getting started, CIA came up with this term called echo chamber. You ever heard of it? Not really, no. All right, so check, check this out. Like personal brands, okay? Yeah. There's a whole world of people who don't know what personal branding is, right? Yeah, a lot. So, so technically, knowing about personal branding to even have that data in your head, there's only a f how many how many humans on the planet you think know that data? Two, three percent, five. Okay, so let's let's call it a couple million people that might know the term personal branding, but literally that leaves like a billion and a couple hundred million that don't oh. have any idea what it is. So that means that anybody who's aware of what personal branding is, as an example, is in what's called an echo chamber. Meaning, if I communicate with people inside of this bubble who know what personal branding is. They're going to know about it. They're going to, they're going to be able to talk about it. People who are outside of that bubble, who have no idea what it is, they can't share the reality that the people in the bubble can. So the, the point of an echo chamber, like, let's say I watch baseball 
uh, and you don't watch baseball. Well, we, we couldn't have a conversation there. So we'd likely move to the next point where we might find commonality. So people participate in multiple echo chambers at one time. But once again, an echo chamber is essentially somebody participating in a collective shared set of beliefs. Okay, so like religions could be echo chambers, uh, watching sports could be echo chambers, even like little things like knowing how to do Facebook ads, echo chambers. So long story short, the size of your echo chamber really does dictate how much revenue you can produce from any given echo chamber that you choose to participate in. So if you choose to, let's say, talk about board games as a personal brand and you want to teach people board game strategies, there's probably such a limited amount of the population. Number one, board games are cheap. Number two, there's probably a limited amount of the population actually is going to care about listening to somebody talk about board games. And number three, because the size of that echo chamber is limited, the, the scale of your personality brand becomes limited because you're not going to ever expose yourself to 100% of one given echo chamber. You're going to expose yourself to a certain percentile of it. So let's say I choose to talk about something like sales or I choose to talk about something like marketing. There's, there's literally like hundreds of millions, if not, if not a billion people on the planet that likely care about sales, that likely care about marketing. And, and because of the size of that specific echo chamber, even if I can take 0.5% of a couple hundred million people, that is a substantial quantity of revenue if I'm selling a $3,000 product as an example. So, you know, I know that this is, this is a little, like I'm, I'm giving you as somebody who's just getting started an approach that might seem a little scaled right now. Like you might just be like, dude, that's a lot. Like, I don't, I'm just getting started. Like, why would I need to think of all that? It's very important to think of all that right away because if you go into a given echo chamber and it's too small and you find out as you're scaling and you then have to pivot yourself out of that into another echo chamber, well, peace out to all that time that you just invested and building a personal brand, by the way, it costs, it costs money. Like you have to spend money and fly around and meet people to get positioning. You have to just spend time doing things like podcasts and, and speaking gigs and uh, documenting it all and spending money to distribute it. And well, I mean, there's so many different things, but my point is if you spend all that time and money <laughs> building yourself in the wrong echo chamber and, and you find out the hard way, that's a fool's game. You know, you want, you want to play the game the smart way, which is learning through other experience. I've seen personal brands who are, who are guppies in a massive industry that are doing 20, $50 million a year, personal brands. I've seen people who own who, who, if you ask anybody in their given echo chamber, hey, do you know who this person is? Near 100% of people will be like, oh yeah, I know who that person is. But they're, they're making no money. Uh, Dan Locke said this, for uh, fame without fortune is frustration. So I know people who are very famous in given echo chambers, but they're not able to monetize it because once again, the, the dollar value of what the people in the echo chamber are buying and like why they're collectively in an echo chamber, whatever beliefs they're sharing, they don't, they don't line up to the scale that the personal brand wants to be at as far as their revenue goals and how many students they want to help and things like that. So you got to think of these things ahead of time, build out a strategy, uh, essentially, essentially saying, this is my entry point. This is the kind of market I want to go into. These are the types of problems I want to solve. Um, and then, then you essentially are scaling your story from there. People find relatability in your story. Um, you're essentially vocalizing your beliefs at that point. Once you, once you enter into a given echo chamber, that the tactical side of that is like, go find some Facebook groups for people that share those types of beliefs in the echo chamber. So if, once again, if I like baseball and I want to teach, like, let's say I'm an ex MLB player. So I'm somebody who already has real life results and I want to teach baseball fanatics how to have a better swing. Well, in that case, I would go enter into as many like MLB fan groups. I would go enter into as many like individual team groups. I would go also find the groups that are like skill-based groups. Like we're trying to acquire this given skill and we're trying to be better at X. And then I would start giving like long form advice on that. I would start talking about my beliefs inside of these given communities because uh, people are going to share your beliefs that you have. Um, I would, I would just give pointers, like same, same kind of example. If I was that baseball player, I'd be talking about like how to improve your swing and I'd be writing content with it and I'd be shooting little videos with it. And I'd just be, I'd just be giving stuff away. I'd be writing LinkedIn articles. I'd be writing medium articles. I'd be uh, creating little videos and distributing them on my Facebook and Instagram and paying to get it in front of the person I eventually want to sell because social interaction is now retargetable. It's like the modern day email marketing. So, so point is, um, if you're first getting started, just identify a market, identify the entry point, go and tactically get as connected into that community as you can. Find events that you can go to where once again, everybody in that echo chamber is coming collectively. 
and start participating. Just start, start, start giving value. Cause once again, as soon as you start giving value and as soon as you start talking about your beliefs, it's just natural human behavior. Other humans who, who share those beliefs will literally come and reaffirm that what you're talking about is good because they're doing it for themselves. Once again, they're doing it to reaffirm that they're participating in a reality that they believe in. So, so personal branding is much deeper than most people think. But point is, if you think ahead of the game, <laughs> you get ahead of the game. <laughs> no, that's legit, man. And I love the way that you kind of went like so deep into the answer because you almost change the way that I want to ask you the next couple of questions because now I have so many things that I got from your from your answer in there. So um, what you said in there, it's something super powerful. And I think, and I hope people are taking notes. If not, you know, go back into uh, the actual answer that Jeremy just gave us. So rewind. <laughs> uh, no, for real. So for example, somebody's just starting out and what you said in there is super interesting, right? Because so many people are talking about Oh, niche down at the beginning and then, exp you know, then expand into a different market. So pick like pick an industry and pick a niche because otherwise it's going to be hard to get noticed. Uh, but then you gave um, your friends. Um, I, I, I totally forgot his name and I'm such a big fan of his magic tricks, but I forgot. Julius? I told, yeah, Julius. So you yeah. gave Julius example when uh, when he just started his Instagram um, page. And he actually, instead of just using the paid ad um, version, he went after influencers. Like, so he used a lot of influencer marketing. So for example, let's say you're just starting out. What do you think it's best to focus on the first time to get noticed? Um, you go after influencers and you pay to get, because at, at the end of the day, it's still paid advertising, right? Like yeah, it's sure. you either pay influencers or you pay Facebook or YouTube or whatever. But what do you think it's, <laughs> especially when you want to get noticed in a, maybe in an industry that you're not well known yet, you know, you get the point. Yep. So to, to the regular person, the easiest thing to do is just start paying. Um, I talk about this in my, in my university, it's called personal brand university, where you as a personal brand, you should have a main vehicle that is funding your ability to be a personal brand. So it's like, I'm an agency owner, but I'm also a personal brand, but the revenues I make from my agency enabled me to start spending money to build my personal brand. So you, you don't want to just start with, okay, I want to get into business. That means I need to build my personal brand. It's like, you want to have a business and have something that you can, that you can use to fund this because when you're going to start spending money to distribute your content, that's not a revenue driven action. That's, that's a brand building action. Those people that see that content and that interact with your social media profiles, they become retargetable. So those become valued lists, just like email marketing. You get you get the opportunity to retarget people for up to one year from the duration of time uh, from the point that they interacted with your social media profiles. So long story short, the game really becomes, I need to start creating content. Um, there's a good statistic. It was, it was done by Cisco in a study that talked about how people were consuming content online. Over 80, 83% of it was video uh, in 2018. And that statistic was continuing to climb for 2019, but obviously we have to wait until the end of the year. It was upwards of already 92%. So video is the name of the game. So then it becomes, how can I differentiate myself in an oversaturated market? Because at this point, when you're a personal brand, you're typically coming into any market, it's going to be saturated. There's, there's very few industries at this point where you're going to be able to come in and be a true, like unique new voice as an example. There's still a few, to be clear. You might be listening to this and be like, I got the one, but most people, once again, it's probably saturated. Uh, point is, once you've identified that you need to be shooting video, you, you're going to be entering into a saturated market. You're probably asking yourself, how do I differentiate myself? It comes down to quality comes down to consistency. It also comes down to speed. And there's a few other points, but I'll just break down those three to start. So quality, it's like, you need to buy the right equipment. So it's like, I was just, I was just at Hermitage Hotel in Nashville. And uh, I was just on podcast yesterday. His name, his name was Johnny Games. His podcast called the No Excuses Show that he was, that he was introducing me to. And, you know, he, he'd asked me, because I plugged in this little mic to the bottom of my phone. He was like, what's that? I said it was a Shure microphone, S-H-U-R-E. Plugs, plugs right into the little lightning cable at the bottom of my phone. He set it up on a tripod. That gives me crystal clear quality audio instead of just relying on what's naturally built into the iPhone as an example. Just having that little thing, it's like three inches big, just fits in my backpack, I take it everywhere I go. That, that creates a massive difference in the quality of my audio and anything that I choose to capture while I'm on the go versus a standard I'm just going to shoot with whatever's built into the phone as an example. In addition to that, the quality of the video makes a massive difference. It's really, really cheap product. I know that this might not be cheap relative to how much money you have listening to this, but it's called the Mevo, M-E-V-O. 
Um, you can get the Mevo Plus, that's the newest version. It's like 600 bucks or 700 bucks or something like that. And it's really cool, it has AI built into it, connects to your phone wireless, wirelessly, and your phone essentially becomes the viewer. So it becomes like you're watching whatever's on the camera on your phone, like in real time. It will pick up your face, so it has facial recognition, and then it will create in real time like cuts in your video, like professional cameramen are behind the scenes, like tracking your face, moving the camera. Like if I'm presenting something on a whiteboard, it will actually track and pan over to the whiteboard like while I'm writing on it. And as soon as I turn back and face the camera, it'll pan back towards me. It'll cut out and create like a wide angle shot. So essentially when you take the SD card out of it, or if you just stream directly to Facebook or YouTube, cause it does that too live, you have a fully edited clip you take out the cost of a videographer, you take out the cost of an editor, you have a high quality shot that most other people are not gonna have. You have a really portable device that you can take with you. Same thing, it's like three, four inches big, it's a little cylinder. You know, and if, if you take like a like a mic stand with you somewhere, same thing, those can be collapsible down to like a foot or, or like eight to 12 inches, I imagine. Point is, just investing in those two things alone when you're first getting started can create a massive differentiator for you entering into a saturated market. The quality of your video and the quality of your audio is going to enable somebody, especially when they're getting flooded with all these videos from other competitors. You got you to remind yourself, even as a personal brand, when you're first getting started, you're dealing with corporations who spend 150K, $300,000 on a production studio to record their content. So that's what people are used to seeing. Like Facebook themselves funds watch shows and influencers to create content. So, so you got to create quality stuff especially if you're entering into a market that's saturated. Okay, in addition to that consistency, so all the algorithms will reward consistency. You're uploading to YouTube daily or weekly or on a set schedule at a set time, they reward you in the algorithm. They give you more distribution and reach. You do the same thing in Instagram, um, same kind of concept. You have higher probability to get into the explore page. You have a higher probability to get more reach for the people that actually follow you in the newsfeed. Um, your stories will also show at a higher rank than everybody else's stories that that same person follows. You can get more viewership in your stories as well. Um, Facebook, not so much. If you're consistent with Facebook, they really don't care anymore. <laughs> you got to pay for almost everything <laughs> to, to get any reach on the uh, on the Facebook newsfeed. But um, IGTV is probably the biggest opportunity right now when it comes to organic reach because uh, IGTV just announced that they're now going to support like horizontal videos yeah. rather than simply the... The, the vertical ones that they were uh, endorsing. So that's great because they pretty much found nobody's gonna create unique content for IGTV. They all just wanna repurpose their YouTube videos or their Facebook videos. So, th so they're allowing you to upload to that. But while, while Instagram needs more daily users on IGTV, you can see them starting to do all the growth hack stuff, like allowing the IGTV thing to be on your, on your standard profile for people to be able to click like as if it was a regular post and it takes them over to IGTV app. Um, more, more of the story is, they're going to give more algorithmic distribution if you're uploading consistent IGTV clips versus almost all other platforms. LinkedIn would be another one that's, that's up there right now as far as a, I can be an influencer simply by posting consistently kind of thing. So my, my point of saying consistency is you're not going to be consistent on Facebook and get a reward unless you're paying to distribute all your content. But consistency can be a growth hack when you're first getting started. One of my buddies, Brandon Carter, he's uh, he's at King Keto on Instagram. He has 1.5 million people on Facebook that like him. He, he grew that in a couple months when Facebook did have algorithmic weight on videos. He would post a video a day. Those videos would take off organically uh, because that's what the algorithm wanted people to do. So it's, it's kind of like the tax system here in the United States. It's not really bad. It's not, the algorithms aren't bad. They reward you when you do things they want you to do and they punish you when you do things that they don't want you to do. And that's their only way to communicate with everybody. They have 2.3 billion daily active users. So the only way that they can communicate what's good and what's bad is through statistically punishing you or, or rewarding you. And hopefully you're keeping an, an eye on the insights to actually see like, okay, repeat that action. That was good. Don't do that action again. I got punished. Uh, most people don't do that. So when I say consistency, it means identify where you're going to algorithmically actually get a benefit from being consistent, such as IGTV and LinkedIn uh, right now. Anyway, it's good change by the time you listen to this podcast in the future. Okay. Um, last one I said, I think was speed. So yep. speed matters as well. If I shoot content with a video guy and it's a speech, I want it done in like 24 hours. I want it to be edited like it took a week as far as the quality. I just don't have a week to wait. The, the real time need for being fast is important. Like if I, let's say, let's say there's some trending event, like let's say McGregor gets into a fight with Mayweather again. You, you only have like a 24 hour window to really capitalize on that trend by talking about something that's McGregor and Floyd related. But if you do it in like a week after the event, 
you know, you're not going to have nearly the algorithmic benefit as you would if you were talking about it during the duration that it was actually trending. Um, same, same kind of thing just with what's on people's minds. Like if there's something out there that you see that people are talking about collectively in your echo chamber, if you talk about it too, while they're talking about it, you get the benefit of being fast, capitalizing on the trend, also getting a higher quantity of people that are going to be watching your stuff because you're capitalizing on what other people can't. You, you'd be surprised a, a large quantity, like definitely a majority above 80% is going to be slow, is not going to be able to capitalize on trends because they lack speed. They're comfortable. They're complacent. You're really, you're really only going to go head to head and actually compete with very few personal brands when you're a personal brand in your given industry. Um, it's, it's not, it's not as competitive as what most people might think, because as soon as you just start doing the very basic things that are really sourced from discipline that other people are flat out unwilling to do, they're, they're not willing to cross certain obstacles. They're not willing to lower certain, certain barriers on comfort. Then you statistically will become ahead. The more that you do those things and the less that the other person does those things. If I do two things a day that somebody else won't do, and I do that for a full 30 days, even if they started 30 days later, I'm always going to be 30 days ahead. Um, so same kind of thing. This, the speed that you can do certain things truly does create a distance and a competitive advantage when you're a personal brand. Uh, but you're not going to really see that until you start creating content and getting the game. So once again, it all, it all sources with kind of what I spoke about. You need, you need quality video and you're going to need, you're going to need some kind of main vehicle in order to fund the distribution of some of these things, unless you're going to solely rely on organic distribution and kind of like what Julius did, reaching out to other people and asking them to share your stuff. Awesome. I know like it's, it's super important for people to understand, I guess. Um, now you make me think, uh, I'll probably have to release this episode much quicker than three weeks. It's just that it's all <laughs> scheduled, <laughs> but well, it was, uh, no, no, it I mean, was you, do, you do get a competitive advantage. The more it's not necessarily the, the higher quantity of content that you put out. It's more just about like being able to get things done in real time. So, so the next thing that happens that could be a trend that could actually blow your personal brand up. Like there could be different waves that come that you can't capitalize on because you're operationally backed up from things that happened weeks ago that disable your opportunity to actually take advantage of certain things. So it's not even just about like, I need to be fast and do everything. It's more about, I need to just be, I need to have my lines freed up so I can take advantage of opportunities when they come. Cause they, cause they come and I need to be fast to be able to, to actually capitalize and ride the wave of certain social trends. No, it makes a lot of sense, man. And you also mentioned a few things that, that kind of gets me to the next question. You really focused a lot on IGTV and LinkedIn. Now, uh -huh. when you compare those to, let's say, platforms like YouTube or podcast, uh -huh. um, what do you think still LinkedIn and IGTV will kind of uh, beat the podcast world and the YouTube videos just because it's almost like a trend for 2019 for people to actually focus on those. And then of course you can repurpose the content and, you know, because of batch producing and all that stuff, you can repurpose them into audio format and all those things. But do you think it's best for somebody that's let's, cause we were talking about people starting out, uh, comparing to somebody that already has a business and they just kind of, you know, remove, not necessarily remove themselves from the business model, but just create like a personal brand, um, side to side. Uh -huh. but do you think IGTV and LinkedIn is, best to really focus on and, and post daily as opposed to, you know, a daily YouTube video, right? Not necessarily. I mean, it depends. It depends on where your audience is for sure. Like as an example, if I'm talking about starting and scaling a marketing agency, I'm not going to do it on LinkedIn because there's, there's an older demographic on LinkedIn that's actually using the platform daily. Most, most of the younger generation is actually using Instagram more frequently. Some of them Snapchat, the ones who are like anti Facebook use Twitter. Uh, those would be the platforms as an example that I would put content out about starting and scaling a marketing agency. If as an example, I was a professional or I sold some kind of B2B service, or I felt like I was selling something to an older demographic, I would be posting on LinkedIn specifically because there's that algorithmic advantage of, of posting video consistently on that platform right now. Cause there's such few video creators as a whole, especially comparatively to all the other social media platforms that are out there. So IGTV, the reason that I mentioned IGTV right now is because it is integrated with Instagram directly. Um, as I mentioned, they allow you to, to post to landscape videos now rather than just horizontal videos. So that formatting option that they just opened up, what it tells me from the history of watching social media platforms when they do updates is that there is going to be an algorithmic weight on videos that are posted to IGTV and especially for people who post them consistently. So let's say you're already posting videos on YouTube or you're already posting videos on LinkedIn. It's a wise idea for you to bring them over to IGTV because you're going to get that algorithmic advantage. 
Now that's the, let's just, let's just be clear. These are technically short-term, short-term benefits because as a whole, like Dan Locke teaches me that, I mean, your, your personal brand should not be a short game. Like you should be in it for the long, like you should be thinking like 25, 50 years out and like the transitions you're going to make along that path. So if you're talking LinkedIn and, and IGTV in that grand scheme of things for how you should be thinking of your personal brand, this is like freaking fart in the wind. I mean, this is just, this is a short term thing. Now, now podcasting. Okay. That's definitely a long game because right now on the search engine side of things, Google just announced in a recent update that they are allowing podcasts to rank inside of the search engines now. So that's huge. If you're using playlists. Yeah. I mean, if you're using platforms like, like, uh, what's it called? Anchor that allow you to distribute across literally all of the different podcasting channels at once, like you can syndicate across all channels, then that to me is just mathematical probability that you're increasing your chances of ranking for that specific episode in the search engines, wherever the specific channel, like let's say iTunes gets more traction, Stitcher, I I don't know, maybe Spotify gets more traction, like all those. Whichever one I imagine gets more traction is going to be the one that ranks inside of the search engines. Or maybe once again, just from from Google's perspective, they're only allowing like iTunes or they're only allowing Spotify to actually rank. Whatever that might be, that's where I would put more weight if I was a podcaster. Because same thing, I'm looking for the algorithmic advantage because that's that's it's, it's not just about creating the content. It's about how am I actually going to get people to listen to this? How am I going to build my foundation of attention out? Because that's what these personal branding businesses are built on. They're built on a foundation of attention. Um, so long story short, yeah, they're all good plays, but you know, it might not be a good play if, you know, depending on the, depending on the demographic, like who's where podcasting to me is always a great play because, uh, most people don't know this. There's a good, do you read? If I read? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a good book called frogs and princes by Richard Bandler. Have you ever read it? I haven't. No. So this, this is the guy who created neuro-linguistic programming and he certified guys like uh, literally everybody like Tony Robbins and just uh, like every person. So Long story short, in the book, Frogs and the Princes, he introduces this, this model called the VAK, which, which stands for Visual Auditory Kinesthetic, which every, every human on the planet has an input and an output for learning, meaning we learn things in a particular way or in a combination of ways, and we output things in a particular way or in a combination of ways. So 35% of the population is visual, 25% is auditory, and 40% is kinesthetic. And for clarity, because I didn't know what kinesthetic meant when I first heard it. Um, kinesiology is, is like the study of the body. Kinesthetic people would operate off of their sense or their emotional state as an example. So if I was in, if I was in a conversation and I wanted to identify whether somebody was visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, they'll either show you or tell you which one they are. Like as an example, if I say, Hey, you want to buy this gallon of water? The visual guy would be like, uh, looks great. I just want to show it to my wife real quick. Uh, then, then we'll make the decision, but yeah, it looks looks good looks like something that we'd want to see uh, in our home. home yeah so the auditory person would be like hey you want to you get the jug of water auditory person would say listen it sounds great you know i could really hear myself chugging that thing later today and feeling refreshed uh <laughs> but i'll tell you what i need to go talk about it with so-and-so you know <laughs> and the kinesthetic person they'd be like man whoo that i bet that's gonna feel great <laughs> to to drink that water later i bet it's cold crisp whoo it's <laughs> i can already feel it. it's giving me the chills you know uh, you know my me and, me and my boy were over here talking about it and uh yeah i think it, fe- it feels good it feels good we're ready to we're ready to go you know and it's all like action terms and verbs and like things that operate with sense so point is podcasting technically taps 25 percent of the population that you know all these all these video creators aren't tapping there's I take people like myself like i don't have a podcast i get on other people's podcasts so i can still cater to that 20 because i literally know 25 percent of all humans on the planet are gonna prefer to have this awesome. same message that i've that I've, pro- I've probably said in different ways in different videos broke down into audio instead um so point is this is a massive advantage absolutely but but they're all technically massive advantages depending on like who your market is and where they're at and like what kind of content you're creating on all of them for sure no and uh, and it makes a lot of sense um but if we let's say we take it a step further now and because mm-hmm. we talked a lot about the you know the beginner level and also a lot of other strategies around that but after you worked with so many you know big and large uh, personal brands what do you think it differentiates like for example Dan Locke is one of my mentors too uh, when I interviewed him I think two no about a year ago out of the other Funnel Hacking Live um, he shared with me a few things that I that really stick to my head was 
always look for the person that is continually growing. Like it's not just somebody that's there for one time and then they going down like whatever, right? Like yep. Ben Log literally blew out completely in the in the last like two years. I remember when I interviewed him, I think he had like a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube or something like that. And you look now, he's got like 1.6 or something like that. Yep. <laughs> so what do you think, and of course it's the, foundation that his business was built on and the fact that he was able to scale um, like the model that of course the course the high ticket closer program and, uh -huh. and the other things around but what do you think it differentiate him and his brand from so many other people that were kind of competing <laughs> with him at the same time yeah so this this is where I at the beginning of, of this conversation I spoke about there's definitely some secrets and it's not just hard work that actually position these big guys as big guys so Let's take, let's take Dan as a, as a good example. Um, content is not for what most people think it is. A majority of people, their content strategy is very random. It's very chaotic. It's typically very reactive. Uh, what I found working with, with I mean, even the big guys, honestly, like Dan, Dan has been extremely impressive in his ability to apply psychology, which has positioned Dan as my all time favorite client. Like no, no questions asked. Um, his entire team is full of sophisticated, smart, like entrepreneurs. And it, it, it is truly an honor to be able to participate like in him, in, with him and helping him build his personal brand. He and his content strategy are completely different than everybody else's in the game. Content is for belief management and future objection handling. Content controls the frame, okay? Perspective is reality, okay? And there's these things called paradigms. So most people are experiencing whatever it is that they think in their head is going on in the world. And there's typically a lot of shared realities out there. Like you can say a lot of people, like for example, I, I had the struggle to, to not struggle story. There's a lot of people who also struggled and are no longer struggling. You could say that that's like a common paradigm that people went through. So if I communicate that type of story at scale and I talk about the different, the different events, the different transitions, the different obstacles, the different setbacks, how you emotionally feel like throughout that process, and more importantly, what changed to create a new perspective along the way, what you actually do is you tap into a story that people are telling themselves at scale. Okay. So this is important to understand. <laughs> we go a little deep here. Ask, ask questions if, if, if it gets a little too intricate. So at scale, once again, humans are telling themselves roughly, we'll say 25 to about 30 different stories, give or take their geographic location. So let's, let's talk about like the US, Canada, like the UK as an example, like Europe. There's, there's a lot of people pretty much telling about 25 to 50 different stories all together, like between all humans, like the struggle to not struggle story, the, I just got out of the military and like, I'm dealing with this kind of perspective situation. Uh, by the way, it's Memorial Day. Thank, thank you to all those who serve. Um, right. There's the story of, you know, I, I'm, I'm an avid reader. I'm intellectually capable but I'm, uh, an, I'm analytically paralyzed, meaning I have analysis paralysis. Like how many people do you know that say they have analysis paralysis? Oh boy, like <laughs> insane. It's, 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 it's one of those grand archetype stories that like people as a whole are telling themselves. So long story short, once you get this grand visibility on all these different types of stories that humans are telling themselves, the struggle to not struggle story, definitely a very common you know, a lot of people sharing that kind of story. And if you're just tapping into that one vertical at scale, you know, you'll, you'll definitely do great as a, as a course creator that's helping people develop skills and transition out of those moments. Cause all, all you really have to do is talk about all the different transitional points. And once again, how things were versus what you transition them to be. And more importantly, in each one of those transition, there's about five to maybe 10 different mental shifts that you made beliefs that you used to hold that you had to unlearn and you had to plug something else in place in them. So if you take all these transitional moments throughout your grand story, you might be able to create a list of like 75 different transitional moments throughout your story of struggle to not struggle. And more importantly, for those 75 different transitions, you might be able to see, you know, two to 10 lessons in each transition that can create you you know, literally like 300 to 400 different pieces of content that you could put out that are true. Like this, this, you can go to Dan's profile if you want to see an example of this, because this is just practicing what I'm preaching right here. The Instagram page, the Facebook page, the YouTube channel, everything is about belief management and future objection handling. So it's about shifting people's paradigms 
so they could see the world the right way before we pitch them. Okay. So we're not the pitch man. Okay. You ever been to the mall? (laughs) You ever had somebody walk up and pitch you on some random shit that you don't need and that you're not qualified for? I had a guy when I was 16, try to sell me a house. He was like, Hey, do you need a home? I was like, dude, I'm 16. Like, what are you talking about? I'm in the freaking mall. I'm trying to just have a good time. There's nothing to do in Ohio. He's like, oh, come on. You know, my point is it made me feel weird. You know, just like, ah, get away from me. Like you, you have that percent. You ever hear of the slimy salesperson? You know, why is, why is that perception exist? Because that's, that's the type of person. It's like, that's how most internet marketers are. That's how most personal brands are. They are a pitch man in its entire they, They're the mall salesperson. Sign up for my PDF, you know, go, go watch my new webinar, uh, go buy my course. And they're saying this to people who don't know them, who don't care about them, who, who literally never heard of them before. And there's no frame and they're they're just pitching. They're burning 98% of people. 98% of people are like me when I was 16. They're like, dude, you get away from me. Like, no, I'm not qualified for that. Who are you? You know, but the the problem is one to 3% of anybody at any time that you shout a message to will buy. So out of a hundred people, one to three will buy. If I just shot a message to hundred, I'd go to Disneyland and be like, I have pretzels. Who wants them? Three people would walk up and they'd buy them guaranteed. Uh, and my, my point is that's what enables this like mall salesperson persona to continue because that's all any marketer has ever talked about. Nobody really talks about framing and applied psychology because it's hard. It's, it's not like an easy thing to do. Uh, and it's not an easy thing to understand. Like it's, it takes years just to be able to comprehend some of these more advanced lessons and like watch yourself apply them and be able to get the feedback on it. So you can then, you know, know what you're doing and be able to deploy it again in a controlled way rather than just by accident. So if you look at Dan, like none of it's by accident. Um, every piece of content is specifically created because we've identified in these grand archetype stories that there's people that are in different transitional moments And there's very specific key lessons and very, very key feelings that they have throughout these processes. And we talk about what they were. So we talk about what they need to unlearn. We relate to those situations and then we create new ways for them to think in those moments. And they do. Humans, if you're actually dealing with how they operate, you would know that 20 to 40 neurons per second fire off in the conscious mind. 20 to 40 million neurons per second fire off in the subconscious mind per second. So my point is, People record every single thing they see. So if you stop acting like you need to get people interested and get their attention and you just instead present things that directly communicate to the person's subconscious, like they will pay attention. They will know what's going on. They will relate. Humans are smart. Um, They can quickly identify if some, if somebody's authentic, if somebody's inauthentic, if somebody's in an alpha frame, if somebody's in a beta frame, we, we qualify advice before we even hear it. There's a whole different strategy to getting people to actually listen. But point is, just with content strategy in itself, uh, everything you see Dan do is very strategic. It's all applied psychology and it's all managing the beliefs of the people that we're eventually selling. We'll retarget all the social interaction and, and those will be the people that we'll pitch ads to. Of course, we always try to prove that that is actually cheaper and gets a higher quantity of people to buy by still doing cold advertising and direct response. But 10 out of 10, the leads, the cost per sales are cheaper. We're building a massive brand at the same time that we're doing that typical strategy that I just described and every piece of content can be deployed and can be leveraged in a strategy at scale. But long story short, it, it's hard to get that initial visibility on what are these like grand archetype stories, like the struggle to not struggle story, the I'm a paralysis analysis guy. I'm a, you know, I read, but I always, I'm always put in the corner before I can take action. You know, like there's all these different stories that people tell themselves and you start to see that there's these big patterns. Uh, and then when you see the patterns, you'd be kind of surprised of how easy it is to tap into those different stories because you know, when you're at this level of like, I'm going to, I'm going to apply these different psychology lessons into my marketing and you can really like see it and get visibility on it. Um, not this, this, this might be the wrong way to describe it. You, you get visibility to the point where you're like above the story where although you get to tap into the different moments in their stories, you're essentially leveraging, different pivotal moments that these people are at in their lives that are massive, like big moments to them. And you need to consider that, that to you, you're just going to, you know, especially when you're using multiple grand archetypes, you're, they're, they're just going to be another moment to you. But if you get the severity of where these people are at and you really like put that into your content, ooh, you know, you same kind of thing, big differentiator compared to, to everybody else is going to be creating content for that. So long story short, people didn't stand a chance to get Dan Locke when he came out. Uh, 
because because he's applying things that nobody else does as i said there's there's strategies that people won't find until they reach a certain point of scale now there's one strategy i just came up with it's called the harvester i i came up with it because i ran out of customers i was spending a million um, and then 1.1 million per month ad spend climbing revenue climbing and then one day the revenue just plateaued like literally wouldn't go down and it wouldn't go up because we were only marketing to one grand archetype story. We were only tapping one market. And then I realized, I was like, oh, I didn't responsibly, I looked at myself like a farmer. I was like, I didn't responsibly grow, tend to plant, like allow the natural cycle of time to, to allow other fields to grow. I simply approached one field, harvested the hell out of it, put all the crops in my, in my, little, my little buggy with me, and I sold it. And I came back to harvest more and I didn't have anything else to harvest. So what I had to do is I had to create a new strategy that at scale, we could tap all these different grand archetype stories at one time and create this machine that would allow an evergreen scaled conversion plan um, to be deployed. And since then I've taught it to people like Harmon Brothers, um, Garrett White has been deploying it recently. Um, I just, taught, I just taught it to Kevin David partially, not not all the way though. He didn't he didn't do a full in person. Um, Ray Higdon's one guy who uh, who just learned part of it as well. Uh, but there's there's very few people right now that know that strategy. But the point is, very few people can apply it because you know most personal brands aren't actually marketing at scale. Most personal brands, you know, they they need to play the smaller game first, make more revenues until they can level up to that point. But Dan proved the model that you can you can go from zero to freaking a couple million dollars a month in under a year. Uh, by deploying the right secrets, you know, and so so I'm not just blowing smoke up people's ass when I say that there's things that people don't know that if you do know, they get you results faster, like literally, but they're tough to comprehend, and that's why most people aren't doing it. <laughs> no, but like you, uh, I remember um, I saw a couple of your stories mentioning that strategy, and I mean, just on a PDF form, it looks like huge with a bunch of, you know, a bunch of details in there. But um, I want to tap into something that you just said um, about Dan. And I think I may be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you, um, what you said is, of course, like people will relate to your story. So the storytelling part plays a huge, huge role. And I remember when I first heard uh, Dan's story, I related so much more with him because one, he was an immigrant in Canada. I'm an immigrant in the US. So, you know, like just that, that first thing when I heard like, oh my God, like everything that he does kind of, you know, like in my head was like, oh, I can almost apply in my own, you know, journey and then do all kinds of things. So <laughs> storytelling part, like what do you think is the best way to deploy that? Is it through a book like to, to kind of strategize your content around it? Is it to launch it towards uh, a podcast? Is it like, what do you think is the best authority builder using that storytelling part? Is it straight content from the get-go? Or like, do you use any, um, any anything like, I would say kind of like to put it on a pedestal and then work around that? Yeah, video for sure. Just, just given the statistic that once again, in 2018, over 83% of all content consumed, like all content in the world consumed was through video, 83%. That is such a substantial statistic. Um, everything else pales in comparison. So point is, um, you know, you definitely want to be doing video. You definitely want to be deploying like, like the quality, the speed and the consistency leverage that we talked about. But in addition to that, you know, you really want to get a, a very clear perspective on it, you know, is a book within your means to essentially create like you know, books, books aren't easy to write if they're, their, if you're, if they're your first book, especially if you don't have mentors to be able to help you cut costs and to be able to tell you like what to do, what not to do. But if, if let's say a mentor is outside of your means, even just paying to like self publish a book costs about 25 K or 20 K give or, give or take how many books you want to print, like what, what stores you're going to partner with and things like that. So that can really hurt you. It can be very low profit. And then a lot of people obviously don't read. So <laughs> you come into that issue next. Um, books can build credibility though. So books can be a form of of positioning, like it, it can be a way to build authority, especially if you co-author with somebody else who, who's already an authority as an example, which, which can also be easy to do, um, to get a book out there fast. But I don't, I don't believe books come until you get to a certain level of scale in your, in your personal brand. I, I do believe it starts off with videos. That's the easiest to create, take the little, the, the smallest amount of resources. And really at any point you're at in your journey, even if, even if you're living in the hood right now, um, you know, and you have no money, just documenting what you're doing to level up and get out of the hood. 
that will inspire a bunch of other people who are currently below you that see themselves in your story and, and see potential through what you're doing and get inspired by you and, and have their own motivation in their own lives through you. Those people that follow you and are leveling themselves up through time, they end up becoming buyers and you're essentially just creating this giant brand for yourself to be able to later monetize. And if you're doing it the right way, you're doing it strategically from the beginning, you're putting that content to pay to get it in front of people that you do know you eventually want to sell. So you're essentially just creating this giant list of future buyers um, the same way that you would be through targeting with, with ads. You're just targeting with content instead, knowing that you're going to later target them with ads, knowing that it's going to be cheaper if you do it that way rather than just the, the straight up, I'm going to be the mall salesperson and just, just do direct response. Um, so it awesome. definitely depends. Superman. So um, let's say, because I know we're getting closer to wrap things up in here. You mentioned a few days ago something in your story. I think it was um, part of your uh, personal brand academy that is coming up pretty soon, depending uh -huh. on what time you're going to consume this uh, content for all of you guys. But you said something you can apply even at a lower level what the big guys are doing. Oh, yeah into your own personal branding strategy. What do you think is that, like what would that strategy be? Here's, here, here's an easy metaphor for you. You know, if, if you wanna make a million dollars, okay? You probably heard this before, so it's an e is easy, easy answer. Are you gonna ask the dude at McDonald's who works there how to make a million dollars? Or are you gonna go ask a millionaire, a 10 millionaire, or a 100 millionaire how to make a million dollars? Who are you gonna ask? Myself? I'll yep. probably ask the millionaire because he's the closest to the journey that I'm in. Now, of course, the 10, you know, the 10 millionaire or the 100 millionaire, they just, they have done it multiple times. Yep. Um, but in terms of reliability, I would just think like, oh, this guy just did it. And of course, it's like industry specifics and all that stuff. Yep. But that's like, that's, how, that's how, how I see it, I guess. So most, most humans, and, and, and you, you just proved it to be true, can only see one to two levels above or below where they're currently at. So as an example, if I tell you and you're somebody who wants to make a million dollars, that the hundred millionaire would probably know how to do it the easiest way, you likely wouldn't want to talk to him. You'd likely prefer to talk to the millionaire because that's more within the steps that you can see yourself taking. Whereas the hundred millionaire, he might be 10 to 20 levels above where you're currently at. And that's going to be outside of your perception. It's going to be outside of you being able to see yourself in his story. So therefore the relatability goes away. So therefore the, the entire opportunity to actually like you know, get really? advice from that kind of person goes away in its entirety. So point is, you know, I'm telling people that the strategies that the hundred millionaires, the 50 millionaires, the, the 20 millionaire personality brands are using, I'm using myself. I have, I have 14,000 people that like my Facebook page. I have 60,000 as followers on my Instagram. I have, have 2,200 people that, that subscribe to my YouTube channel. I do anywhere from 60 to 120 K a month just on courses coaching events and like personal brand stuff. So I'm, I'm an example of practicing what I preach and being able to say, well, listen, you know, I instead, you know, from working with the guys who are going to reach a hundred million dollars and, and from helping them get to that 20 to $50 million range, it is much wiser to listen to the advice of those guys instead of the people who are doing a million dollars as a personal brand as an example, because as somebody who's doing a million dollars in my personal brand, I'm going to tell you, what the what the 20 to 50 million dollar personal brands are doing that i'm also aspiring to be able to do you see but me applying what they practice as well and, and applying it to my own personal brand i've seen a substantial quantity of results that i never would have seen applying what i can learn from the market as an example let's talk about the personal branding space people who teach personal branding i've done i've done a thorough investigation of the marketplace to identify any key influencers that are talking on the subject and what their most advanced material is and what they're talking about to people who are also getting started. And they're teaching things that are just classic internet marketer stuff. Like you need an Ascension model, you know, like you need lead magnets and then a core product and then upsells. It's like that, that's all really basic stuff that people can Google and learn from digitalmarketer.com and apply into personal branding. What I'm trying to say is there is a completely different game that's being played by the big personal brands that nobody's talking about that once again, is not as easy to do as just the little, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go apply the classic digital marketing stuff into my personal brand and see the results of it. I'm, t I'm saying if you apply the stuff that the 20, 50 million, million dollar personal brands do, you see substantial results that all these other people will never see. And you'll immediately pass up all the other people that are in the position where they're learning from, you know, hey, you need to do an Ascension model or 
you need to you go through these three steps to get people to become aware of who you are it's like there's advanced strategies like you need to sit down like go to my facebook page i put out free content every speaking gig i do i put out more advanced material than every course i've seen and bought myself on personal branding uh every i, I have videos where i'm literally on my desktop like screen recording in the ads manager saying like here's what you need to do here's what type of video you need here's what you need to do like steps one through ten go follow that because that is the same stuff that I'm deploying for the guys doing 20 to $50 million a year. And that stuff gets a substantial result comparatively to some of the things that, you know, you could just learn from regular digital marketer type personalities that, that you could apply into this. So long story short, you know, cause you're not going to learn a, a 30 to 45 minute strategy in, in five minutes, wrapping up a podcast, go to my Facebook page. It's, it's just Jeremy Haynes. Um, don't go to my personal profile, go to my actual page and, and like literally look at my videos. I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. You'll get real value if you're a personal brand. And if you just follow those steps, there's this uh, strategy I call the Venus flytrap. It is a very simple strategy to get started with. It requires you to have three main videos and then you can advertise. It's a way for you to monetize right away. It doesn't take, it's not too content intensive. It would, it would enable us a, a just getting started personal brand after they get those key assets and they, they become aware if they're even positioned to be able to do it. That's kind of what, where it becomes next. There becomes a fork in the road. You're either already positioned to be able to use that type of strategy and you already have the assets or you become aware of the strategy and you have to go through the process of getting the assets, like recording the videos, getting the positioning to have the recordings of those types of videos to then turn it into that strategy to deploy. So depending on where you're at, after you become aware of the Venus flytrap ad strategy, either take action on doing it or take action on positioning yourself to be able to do it and then do it. Um, but go get educated. Don't, don't, don't sleep on the strategies that are getting big results. Love it, man. And we'll make sure we'll list um, your Facebook page and um, I'll go myself and actually search for that video and I'll put it in the description below for all of you guys that are listening or watching this. So <laughs> we are about to wrap things up in here and you shared some uh, some fire and some bombs. Um, Glad I'll, to do it. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll chop all the questions separately because it's literally something that I, I don't think anybody shared on my podcast so far. So one thing that you will leave the audience with, somebody that's Maybe let's say they're selling a service, they're selling a product or whatever. If it's one thing that they could scale through the personality brand uh, and strategies that you teach, what would you think if it's one thing for them to implement? Yeah, good question. So for starters, read this book called Breakthrough Advertising. And that's, that's a great foundational point to get some, some more advanced awareness in how psychology can affect buyers in the marketplace. And then second action, go look up on Wikipedia. Most people, when they hear the word cognitive biases, they think of 25 cognitive biases from Charlie Munger. And they think that that's all there is. But if you go to Wikipedia, there's over 302 different cognitive biases. And if you read through them, I turned them into flashcards. For, for example, I, I give them out to my, my student communities and everybody will literally like be practicing the different cognitive biases and, and understanding them. Because when you start applying those things in your marketing, you get significant results. Um, here's, here's a direct action though, okay? You can go to my page on Facebook. You can go to Dan Locke's page on Facebook. You can go to Garrett White's page on Facebook. And if you watch the cover video, you need a video like that. It's a one minute video. It consists of three main biases that you're trying to establish. Authority bias, social proof bias, and curiosity bias. The footage consistently, or the, the footage essentially, needs to contain shots that build authority inspire curiosity and and show social proof. So as an example, if you're a speaker, you would take all the different B-roll footage of shots of the audience from behind that are looking at one direction of you on stage. Those would be good little B-roll clips. You would take the clips of people coming up and asking you questions after you get done speaking, where you get mobbed by a group of people or people are asking you questions one-on-one. -on -one. You would show those different types of clips. If you're doing meetups in real life, which I, I do quite frequently, I'll have my students come and meet me. I'll hire a videographer. So I get different locations of small groups of people looking in one direction, asking me questions, which once again, humans are smart. If I am walking down the street and there's a group full of people looking in one direction, curiosity is naturally aroused. Every human walking by, I almost guarantee you 90% of them will look in that direction and try to figure out what's going on. They'll literally slow them down like street performers. You'll slow down, you'll pause, you'll consider if it's worth continuing to give your attention to and you'll either pass or you'll stop and you'll participate. The same thing happens on Facebook and Instagram, except the average amount of attention that somebody gives you is 1.8 seconds. 
So if you're walking down the street, the, the street performers probably have a full 10 to 20 seconds of, am I going to give this person more attention or not? You on Facebook and Instagram, you have 1.8 seconds. So essentially you need a montage of these different types of clips. Like sure, you can pepper in. If you're positioned this way, do not fake it till you make it. If you have Lambos and, and Bentleys and like you're getting in helicopters and private jets, like, yeah, that's cool. But if you're not like, once again, go watch my video because I'm a guppy personality brand and I'm an example of, of somebody who's not using those kind of assets and still, still making the kind of money I am as a personal brand. You need, it's called video one. It's the first video you use to introduce yourself to people who don't know you. So that becomes the video that you use to introduce yourself to cold traffic. You're looking to retarget people who get to at least 10 seconds because 10 seconds of viewership is 5.5x the amount of attention that they're giving to regular posts on the newsfeed. Because once again, the average attention span is 1.8 seconds. So they give you 10 seconds, that's 5x longer. As a qualified person that you can then show more content to, to further shift the paradigm of, you're trying to control the perception there, then you pitch them. So point is, go to my page, go to Dan Locke's page, go to Garrett's page, look at the differences between the three videos, see where you're positioned at and what you're able to do and what you're not able to do. And that's what I was talking about. If you are positioned to be able to do that, then do it. But if you're not positioned to do it and you see the type of content that there is there, just know this. It took me it took me about a year and a half just to get that type of footage of doing different speaking gigs, doing different meetups, um, just all the different things that you'll see inside of there. It took me about a year and a half of, of all that footage to be able to create that video. So it's not, a, it's not a short-term thing to do what other people can't do once again. If you, what I would leave your audience with is do the things that other people are unwilling to do. Like for example, I guarantee that 95% of you listen to this. If you actually, if, if you even go watch the videos, cause there'll be a high percentage of you that won't cause, cause, cause non-action takers exist. There'll be a small percent of people who go watch those videos out of that small percent that watch those videos. I guarantee a majority of you again, almost near 90% will be like, Nope, fuck that. I can't do that. That's not for me. There's no way I can get that done and you'll give up, but there'll be a very small percent. There might be 5% of you maybe that'll actually create that video and then distribute it. And you'll go to my Facebook, you'll watch the video, like you'll learn what to do with it. Dude, that'll ch it'll change it. It'll change the game for you. You'll, you'll get the impact of taking the action. And then just remember all those people that didn't take action. That's what I'm talking about. If you keep doing things that other people don't do and won't do, you'll continue to position yourself where other people can't get to. And that's the game of personal branding in a nutshell. You're trying to continue to position yourself further away from the majority into the echo chamber, position yourself as an expert, position yourself as an, as an authority, um, do it in a short period of time so you can monetize it and actually make it worth it for yourself. But once again, do the things other people are not willing to do, do the things that are perceived to be harder, cross more obstacles. Um, you know, once again, get more results than other people will ever get. That's legit, man. And one thing that I haven't really told you at the beginning is like every podcast I try to pull at least a few action steps short term and long term for the audience to be able to implement. But you literally yeah. like right now, you just crush it with the um, with the action <laughs> steps. So I love it, man. Um, one thing that I really appreciate, it's always trying to learn and apply things from people that are actually doing it. So I know uh, a few days ago, I've seen your stories and you putting together this um, personal brand academy together. And I like you to um, maybe share with us when it's that going to be launched and where can people find out more about that? Yeah. So, so it's called personal brand university, uh, PBU for short. It is the Ivy League School of Personal Brand Courses. Uh, it, is, it is no fluff, it is directly what the big dogs are doing. Um, I've been the guy behind the scenes that has just been blowing these people up. As I said, I practice what I preach myself. I, I communicate everything inside of the program to where anybody who comes into the program can use it. But also, if you're a, if you're a heavyweight personal brand, you're gonna, you're gonna really appreciate it because it's gonna help you maximize your positioning and your potential to monetize where you're at in the marketplace. So if you're, if you're already a personal brand, it is absolutely silly not to take personal brand university because of how fast you can maximize and get an ROI and get connected into the community of other personal brands to be able to ask questions in a, in a transparent way. And then on the other side of that, once again, if you're just getting started, this is still something to consider, but make sure you have another business prior to coming into personal brand university. Cause you're going to hear me advocate that inside of the program. This, this is something that you use 
as like a secondary income or a secondary source that you can monetize. Sure, through time, it might become your greatest source of revenues. But in the short term, once again, it's going to cost money to be able to build your personal brand up. So if you're just getting started, um, you have some cash on the side, that could be for you. But don't, don't necessarily jump into it if you're not already in the position where you're a business owner. The website's really simple. It's personalbrand.university. Um, you'll see a long form sales letter I'd, I'd encourage you to read through. You'll see a video at the top of me kind of explaining it. And you'll see an application at the bottom. We will not sell it to you if you will not get a result with the program. So long story short, you can apply. We'll be sure to give you a call and, and fill you out. But with, with you know, integrity, once again, we will not sell it to you if you're not going to be somebody who can get a result with this. So personalbrand.university. And yeah, long story short, Ivy League of Personal Brand Courses. <laughs> That's legit, man. And we'll make sure we'll link that in the description below. Again, yeah. really appreciate everything that you share with us, man. Absolutely. And um we'll make sure we'll probably do a follow-up interview if that's if that's okay with you oh, so yeah. we can actually love serve it. everybody that you know took some action from your uh from your advice appreciate yeah, that'd it be great that'd be great and um also if anybody has any questions you can, you can hit me up on instagram at jeremy and uh you know just shoot me a dm and I'm, I'm very responsive on there so i'll be sure to i'll be sure to shoot you back an answer all right guys i hope you enjoyed this episode with jeremy because he shared some powerful stuff with us things that you can implement tomorrow and things that you can implement moving forward with building your personal brand from scratch all right also his personal brand university program is linked in the description below so you can just go uh check it out and I'm pretty sure by the time that you're listening to this, um, it's going to be launched and it's going to be, you know, one of the most powerful programs on the market. All right. And don't forget, guys, we move the giveaway, the monthly giveaway to weekly now. So every week you can win courses, books, coaching and a bunch of other cool stuff. If you just hit the subscribe button on iTunes, rate and review the show, screenshot it and go to Instagram and DM me at Marion Viesano. I'll make sure I link that in the description below because I know my name is not super easy to spell. But nonetheless, um, it's in the description below. Hit that subscribe button, rate, review the show, and DM me, and you automatically enter into the weekly giveaway. I'm not saying that you're definitely going to win every week, but if you don't enter, you can win. All right? Thanks for listening, guys, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Hey, podcast listeners, I want you to know that I really appreciate your attention and I don't take it lightly. That's why each month we pick a lucky winner and we give away books, mentorship, software, courses, iPads, and other cool stuff. The way to enter is go to clientacquisitionpodcast.com and sign up. You'll get all the details there. Talk to you guys soon. Take care.